welcome to the Frontline Club. Thank you for coming this evening. Sorry. Um, so this evening's event is in two parts. Um, with uh, Jack Schenker and Jason Larkin, who are going to talk a bit about their project, uh, brilliant project, Platinum, which is uh, over in the corner. So, so when you have a chance. Uh, so they're going to be talking to Richard Dowden, who's the director of the Royal Africa Society. We're then going to take a short break when you can go down to the club room downstairs and have a quick drink, and then we'll come back up for e a wider panel discussion. Um, so before we start, if I can just ask you to switch your phones to silent. And when it comes to questions, if you can wait for the microphone, because we are broadcasting live on our YouTube channel. So over to Richard. Thank you very much. Uh, I don't think anybody in this room would be here if they didn't know uh, the basics of what happened at Marikana, 16th of August, 2012. 112 people were, were shot and 34 were killed. Um, the, since then, there's been we thought well, this is a one-off and it won't happen again, but fortunately, some people have gone on digging and trying to dig deeper and deeper into the causes and also the consequences. Uh, and I think uh, Jason Larkin and Jack Schenker have, it's, that's exactly what they've been doing. Uh, um, Jason through his pictures and Jack through his legal work. Um, so what we're going to do just now is just try and unpick what they found uh, talking to the local communities. And I just, it was just a figure that we, when we were discussing this before, just, just really struck me that the, the journalists uh, who covered it uh, obviously went and tried to find out and do what you do as journalists and ring people up. But in the, the press, 61% of the comments were from companies company people, and only 3% of the comments were from mine workers. So it seemed to me that not quite enough shoe leather had been uh, worn out in, in digging out what really happened at that story. Um, so we're going to have, yeah, as you, as you say, we'll have it two halves. And just in this first part, uh, Jack, would you just Tell us about Jason. What, sorry, Jason. Sorry, 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 sorry. Jason. Jason. Sorry. Uh, Jason. Uh, Richard, may I yeah. ask you what has happened to the other advertised figures? Ah, right. Well, this is in two halves, and in the second half, the other advertised speakers will be here. That is um, uh, Andrew Feinstein, um, Desney Massey, and uh, Jim Nichols. And Jim, sorry, and Jim Nichols. Jim Nicholson. Yeah. So after the break. Yeah. After the break. Okay, so, <laughs> Jason. Sorry, what was tell that? Us, yeah, I mean, I tell us what you found. Yeah, okay, Just simply okay. tell us what, yeah, you, yeah. What, what you tried to do and what you found. I mean, I was living in South Africa when the massacre happened. Um, I was working on a project of the legacy of gold mining um, that came out as a book uh, about a year and a half ago, Tales from the City of Gold. Um, I was living with my partner, um, hearing news reports, had never been up to a space like Marikana, I was mainly focused in Johannesburg. Um, and obviously shocked like the country, like the world, those images went around the world. But the narrative that came out, we were, we were completely shocked by this idea that the sort of miners were going up against, you know, this sort of military armed police unit um, with these machine guns and, you know, all the sort of machinery and the guns and the razor wire. It just seemed unbelievable that, this, that the miners would actually charge at this. Um, and I thought, what does this landscape look like? What, what, what are people living? How are they living to end up being in that situation? Um, I did a few stories with different international press, um, and, and I was shocked by the landscape. I was shocked by the living conditions. Um, but I still wanted to sort of spend more time there, getting to grips uh, with the communities, <coughs> Um, and really getting to grips with, I think, just, just showing like, what, what kind of situation these people are living in, um, the, the amenities, the roads, all of this stuff was just so broken. This is not an informal um, uh, economy. You know, this is not a sort of black market kind of mining. This is big time global mining company. Um, so yeah, anyway, the, the idea to just sort of spend longer um, sort of carried on. I was still working on my project, Tales from the City of Gold. Um, and then I moved back to London, and I talked to Jack about wanting to go back out there. And we did a lot of research, and 
Um, we, we got some money from the Pulitzer Center, who sent us back for six weeks. And we were back there last year during the strikes. Um, and, you know, there, there, there's two parts to the story, really. Um, we, you know, the way that it works when you get money from somewhere like the Pulitzer is that you only get money once you've sold the story. So the sort of mechanics of our industry mean that we have to get the story out. And that's a big part of what we want to do. Um, the story had protagonists, it had Tambisa and um, you know, so other, other individuals that we followed for a long time. So I've, you know, there's, there's two sides, I think. There's the, the, the images that we have in this publication, which are just eight images I decided to simmer it down to. Um, but really, for me, the work comes down people and the capital. Were you trusted? Yeah, I, I, I think so. I think so. I think, um, you know, it's, it's an environment that from, if you just took it from the way that the, the official media um, speaks of, you know, it's, you know, absolutely, you know, nightmarish and scary and violent. And we didn't see any of that. So. And what story were you, were you told when you met the miners who had lost friends who'd been at, at the dem demonstration. I mean, I, I think the narrative that if you actually just do a little bit of research is the the, the real story. Um, I, I, I mean, for me, I wasn't so interested in looking back just at that particular moment. That's not for me visually what I've. I mean, that's 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 the impetus to start something, right? To start a sort of investigation, a, a sort of a look at something. Um, so I think you know that's. So Maybe you weren't trying to you weren't trying to be a detective and no 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 not at all not at all no no I mean I think Greg Maranovich did it yeah. perfectly you know yeah. 24 hours after the incident happened um, you know from other photographers photographers that do that kind of work that do this sort of more investigative I'm, I, I, my work doesn't really come from that background I like doing a lot of research I think the the sort of landscapes that I've decided to sort of simmer the project down into for me is what was striking about this space you know you have thousands of miles of crisscrossing power lines above communities that don't even have power i mean that that in its own is enough you know these are miners that are supposed to go to work for you know <laughs> 8 to 12 hours a day um, yet they've come from somewhere where there's only running water at 1am um, you know there are queues for everything the roads are unbelievably bad and it's right next to this you know pretty new very expensive mining facility with all this power crisscrossing the landscape and it's there's these divisions which are yeah unbelievable and, and and visually very very striking and i feel like um you know there's an imagery that we're used to uh, a lot of people understand when it comes to developing worlds you know sort of informal settlements poverty shacks all that kind of stuff um, and there is that sort of imagery within the original story we, did, story we did, which went into the Guardian Weekend magazine, went into uh, International. And, and the way that I've decided to approach it for this publication is, is do something different, both from an economic perspective to try and be able to distribute the publication freely, um, but also just to simmer it right down to its core and, 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 and just turn around and say, all these people have is their numbers. They have nothing else. They don't have a penny to their names for the most part, especially not during the strikes. Um, and they're up against, I mean, you see this sort of zigzagging, complicated sort of landscape of power lines. I think it's quite, uh, yeah, it sort of is a little motif of, of, of the way that these spaces are run. They're, they're, you know, the, the, uh, the economists will try and confuse you by all the economics of it, and, oh, it's not really that profitable, and that's why we can't really pay people more than... 20, you know, it, so there's, there's this sort of complicated position there that actually, when you strip it right down, I, I don't think it is that complicated. This is very bare bones. These are desperate people in desperate times. And I think the way that I put just those images against each other, um, the people, actually from my perspective, it's a celebration of the people, like their determination, their, their will. Um, I've never seen anything like it. Five months striking not knowing when the end would be. Um, and you know, all of the images are from the sort of democratic process of elections, of democratic right to strike, um, you know, queuing to, to, to get onto transport, to go to different rallies. Um, yeah, it was very empowering. And Jack, what took you there? So, hello everyone, by the way, thank you for coming. Wow. Um, 
that's the effect I often have when I address public audiences, bringing the light. Um, Jason and I, uh, I'm, I'm normally based in, in Cairo as a, as a journalist, um, but Jason and I had worked together in the past many times, including on publications that were a bit different from your conventional sort of media story. Uh, features which we tried to make bilingual, which we tried to produce in particular formats that would allow us economically to distribute the story to the communities that we were writing about and photographing. Um, and Jason came to me, he was based in South Africa at the time, I was between Cairo and London, and uh, he told me what he told you, which is that he wanted to explore this space further. Like everyone else, I'd been horrified by the images of the Marikana massacre that cropped up on our, on our our. TV screens and also I think like many people who aren't engaged in South Africa on a day-to-day -day level um, appalled and really kind of jarred out of my my kind of comfort zone when it came to thinking about what South Africa was today and, and what it meant Had you today. been there before? Have yeah I'd been there before um, I've actually got some family connections with South Africa but I had uh, despite I think I hope when it comes to Egypt and the Middle East, writing very critically and searchingly about the dynamics of capital and uh, neoliberal reforms and the capacity for meaningful democracy or not under certain kinds of economic systems and certain kind of political structures, largely filed away in my mind as rainbow nation, liberation, um, you know, a, a story that inspires uh, people on every corner of the planet. And the Marikana massacre very visually and very immediately kind of shattered all of that. Of course, for those that are engaged in South Africa and, uh, and of course, living there, that reality has been <laughs> shattered for a long time. So for me, what attracted me to the story, um, I mean, Jason's spoken really well on, on the visual aspects of it. For me, it was a window. As he says, we, we, we weren't detectives. You know, I, I think we just need to set that straight. The people who have done the work, like Greg Marinovich, like uh, Rehad Desai, who have gone there, who have challenged the official narrative, who have dug out the, the, the footage and, and the, the forensic evidence to completely explode not just the government's official narrative, but the many parts of the media, the kind of establishment coalesced around this story, which basically pitted uh, civilization and modernity against uh, pre-modern history, um, and that was that was that that was very much. You know, you look at the headlines uh, in the immediate aftermath of the massacre and in the lead up to the massacre in terms of kind of what was going on. There was this real attempt to um, completely stigmatize the miners, to to place them as something that was completely antithetical to the the normal workings of a modern global economy. Um, so we wanted to go there and kind of. Bill, these other journalists have done to, to destroy that narrative, but we wanted to do it in a bit of a different way, and find a means, both within within the essay. So, for those that don't know, the, the publication is a is a selection of Jason's images. There's basically eight uh, images on four double-sided posters that fold out, and then there's an essay, in my essay in the middle. In um, it's available in either English or Corsa, and. The, the, the idea was that as well as doing your conventional Guardian Weekend story, you're you know, selling it as we have to to try and make a living and fund the costs of the selling it to various European magazines and so on, that we would also try and do something different. We would, um, we would partner with an organization in South Africa, the Marikana Solidarity Campaign. We would give them lots of copies so that they could hold a platinum belt. They could in, uh, and uh, um, kind of get allow communities to critically engage with the work and tell us, do you know what? That was good. That was bollocks. You got this right. You got that wrong. We didn't want to be only two white British journalists who parachuted in and out of Marikana, commodified an incredibly important and ongoing political struggle, and then buggered off and 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 sold a story to the Guardian, even though. There's an element of that, which, you know, which we certainly did do, and we, we by no means think that we have cracked it when it comes to trying to do different kinds of journalism, trying to do types of journalism which uh, are more, much more of a two-way street and much more of a critical process. Um, you know, the vast majority of people in Marikana and other mine worker communities will probably never see this work, unfortunately. 
um, we've only been able to distribute, just because of the funds available to us, about 500 copies of the work in the communities. We'd love it to be 10 times that. Um, just in terms of the costs and, and logistics of us getting out there and being able to kind of meet with different groups of mine workers in the communities and have them tell us what they think of it. We're very limited in that respect, but we're trying and we're trying to get a debate going and we're trying to kind of raise these issues and it felt ridiculous. If anybody's read the essay, and we are selling it here, um, uh, not giving it away for free, unfortunately, so feel free to, to buy a copy, but in the essay, I try and talk a lot about the different lenses that are used to understand Maracana and then to, to both, the, both the physical camera lenses that we all viewed that massacre through originally and then the subsequent footage that came forward to challenge the government narrative, but also expanding out into thinking, what does that tell us about South Africa's politics and economics today? What does it tell us about democracy under neoliberalism more broadly? And it seems ridiculous to sort of interrogate those lenses whilst passively using a kind of tired old media distribution format. So that was the aim, to try and kind of shake things up a little bit and do it in a different way. And whether or not we've succeeded. Did uh, you talk to the, the mine owners as well? We attempted to. Yeah. We approached yeah. Lonmin um, on, I would say, probably about 25 occasions. Uh, the first time, we, first time I emailed the PR department, they, I said, I'm doing a story for The Guardian. They said, excellent. Yeah, we'd love to set you up with an interview with our CEO. And then I can only assume that that afternoon they did some Googling and read perhaps some of my previous stuff. And then the, the interview was cancelled and the next 25 emails and phone calls went unanswered. So uh, we... And the, and the government? Same again, the ANC, as others um, who will be on the panel later, know uh, far better than me and can speak with more eloquence about the ANC's engagement with this issue has been very bold and, in my opinion, very despicable in the uh, degree to which they've either attempted just to disparage the mine workers or to um, just not engage with the issue at all. So uh, to an ANC election rally, because we were there at the moment in which um, it was a really interesting time, a new round of strikes, as Jason alluded to, the longest in on South Africa's history was underway on the platinum belt, but it was also during an election campaign that was uh, coming 20 years after the advent of procedural democracy. Um, it was the first time the born free generation were voting. It was the first general election since Nelson Mandela's death. So it was a really interesting time. And we did go to this ANC election rally and interview some ANC officials there, but they didn't give us an official response to the, mm. to the story. Mm. Have you sent a copy to Sora Ramaphosa? I don't have his address, unfortunately. <laughs> if anyone <laughs> does, do, do pass it on. Yeah, yeah. Help you with that. Um, who, would, who would like to ask some questions? Yeah, there's one here. Very interesting project, thank you. Um, I wanted to ask if you could uh, give us a bit more background on uh, why do you think that the protests broke in South Africa rather than in other um, African countries in which miners work in similar conditions? So what, what was it, just one more time? Cause we, we yes, um, I wanted to ask uh, uh, if you could give us a bit more background on why do you think that the protests um, broke in South Africa rather than in other African countries in which miners work in similar conditions? So, so why, why did such large protests happen in South Africa rather than... I mean, this is perhaps something which um, we can talk more about in the second panel, which is kind of going to look more widely at the political and social and economic situation surrounding Marikana in South Africa at the moment but um, I mean and I think and I think there's I think there's a lot of, a lot of different aspects to it I mean just very briefly I think first of all there are other uh, labor protests across Africa at uh, within within mining communities and um, although Lonmin is is very specifically based in South Africa some of the other big platinum producers also have mining interest like uh, uh, Implats and, and Anglo they have they have mining interests right across the, the, the continent um, and they've had labor disputes there as well as to why the massacre happened I do think that's something that is um, quite specific to the direction South Africa has taken since um, the the formal end of apartheid and the beginning of procedural democracy, but I think that's that's very much the question we're going to be addressing in the in the second half of the the evening, hopefully, if that's okay. Yeah. Uh, and a question over here. Yeah. 
Uh, th thank you very much. I've been um, an active private investor for 30 years and I've never directly owned a mining share, but I would stress that's not from any moral superiority. I've just felt they've been too, too yo-yo. Um, have, did you <laughs> approach, did you ever approach um, UK or indeed European or US based investors, pension funds and the like, to ask them whether they believed uh, the company's um, replies about the killings and whether they had in any way changed their uh, policy towards investing in that company or in the South African mining industry? It's a, it's a really interesting question. Thank you. Um, I didn't, is the, is the answer. Um, and uh, now that you've asked me that, I really feel that given that the essay is 16,000 words long, I should have and should have squeezed that in. Um, but I, I, in some ways, the, the focus of the essay was in trying, in a very small, modest way, to the, the, the statistic that Richard alluded to earlier about in the initial media coverage of the massacre, only 3% of sources quoted were from the mine worker community, um, was a very, very small and modest attempt to try and rebalance that by putting uh, both mine workers and people who live in Marikana, not all of whom are mine workers. In fact, the key character in the, in the essay is a seamstress who, who, who lives in one of the settlements around the Long Min mine. It was very much an attempt to put some of their voices up front and center rather than putting in the in the context of things other kind of i would say elite kind of economic voices because i sort of felt that there's enough of that um, having said that it was important to me to try and get people beyond south africa's borders who would read the essay to think about uh, including myself our own complicity in 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 the the structure of the mineral energy complex in South Africa and the extent, I mean, we all have platinum in our pockets right now, in our mobile phones, um, in our laptops. It's, it's a catalyst in almost every kind of, uh, the production of almost every electrical device in existence. So, and 90% of the global supplies of, sat of platinum are in this stretch of rock, kind of just northwest of Johannesburg, uh, where the massacre took place. So yes, this isn't like a statement about anti-mining, right? Mining yeah. can be done in lots of different ways. Australia Australians do mining fine. People make money. People are very rich. I mean, yeah. there's always environmental fallout. That's, that's in inevitable. But I, I think that's the thing. You can't just turn around and say, evil mining companies. Mm. This is, these are about the people that live around these mining communities. This, the, 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 sorry, that are the mining communities around. They're the people that, you know, they go down into the shafts and, and, and dig this ore up every day for us to have in our mobile phones. This is a very profitable industry. Mm -hmm. and, and this is where it gets very grey when you start talking to economists. How profitable is it? Where are they making their money? How are they sh you know, deciding what profits they're making within South Africa versus outside? And this is where the big fight comes if we start you know, putting more pressure on them to pay more. Then they'll say, well, we're going to close shop. How do you close shop when 90% of the world's platinum's there? Mm. It's not, it's not an answer. But how do, what, are, what are the comparative rates of pay for Australian and Big South time. African? Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Know, face, there's a yeah. huge goal. Yeah. I mean, so it's, it's obviously very, very complicated, but build a road, you know, build some water, <laughs> like put some, you know, sewage treatment in. I mean, these are people that, that 60,000 people, I don't know, it's, it's just maddening. And I think sort of the visual side of it, we do get, I think we are desensitized to what images tend to look like of poverty in Africa. And there's a part of me that wanted to not just sort of tread that, mm. you know, sort of very trodden line and, and, and sort of bring another sort of viewpoint, but yeah. Okay, yeah, lots of questions now. Yes, over there, and then yeah. one at the front here. Yeah. I commend your journalism, and I particularly commend the fact that you've sought to bring the, at least the experience of the people, if you like, on the front line of, and their families, presumably, of the massacre. I do want to quickly respond to the last question. I'm not an investor. Um, <laughs> But I do think the connection with Britain is actually very important, yeah. and it does require further uh, journalistic investigation. I mean, just on Lonmin's website, you'll see who the major investors are. 25% Glencore, massive mining multinational. 5% is owned by Investec. Investec are sponsoring test cricket, rugby, all these sorts of, excuse me for saying, but upper middle class games here in uh, Britain in order to buy a social base. I mean, this is as morally reprehensible, in my view, as the days of apartheid. And 
we will be picketing there to commemorate Marikana, and I'm going to give out leaflets at the end. But I do think, for those of us in Britain, this is the other part of the connection. Uh, uh, and I mean, please do. Please go and take the report to Investec and let them see. I think see. the lawn of Lonmin is London, isn't it? Yeah. No. Is is Londra, yeah, exactly. It was originally Londra. Yeah. Yeah. I think even, even London, Rhodesia. Yeah. Even Ted Heath, that notable yes. Marxist, yes. said they were the unacceptable face <laughs> of capitalism, and not much has changed. Just, just very briefly on that. Um, I mean, first of all, solidarity with the picket, and and let's all get involved. Um, unless you're here from Lonmin, which by all means get up and give your point of view. But um, but yeah, the the, the 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 I mean the other point about that is another investor, I, I wrote a piece in The Guardian about this just the other day, the, the other investor in Lonmin is actually the World Bank itself, or at least the World Bank's, the IFC, its investment arm. And when you think about the role, um, again, we'll talk about this in the second half, when you think about the role the World Bank has played in pushing for market fundamentalist reforms in South Africa that have driven the profound inequality in the first place that has at least in part like created the climate in which the Marikana massacre could take place. Um, you really begin to, to, to think about lines of responsibility and, and the ways in which, um, you know, British, certainly British companies, multinational companies and international financial institutions and governments are drawn into this web. Okay, yeah, mm. another question. As you're aware, the, the police chief who was in, in charge of the Marikana region for the strikes, she has got the blame now for mishandling the actual policing of the situation. Uh, yet, uh, we know from uh, reports that Cyril Ramaphosa was actually in contact with her directly and organizing the policing of the situation. Did you dig deep into this? Uh, was, were there any signs of people from within the police trying to talk to you about the situation, trying to give you any, any type of information that would have led to anything that was you know, obvious that where the orders came from? I'm going to defer to Jim Nicholson, who will, who will be uh, yeah. who will be on the second half yeah. of the panel because he was at the Farnham Commission representing the interests of the miners and can speak with a lot more authority than yeah, than e even another camp. Well, we we didn't speak to the police, um, and I, it's the same in in terms of the the um, speaking to potential investors. Our focus was very much we. For legal reasons, you know, as in any article where you're criticizing a company, we had to approach Lonman for a comment and they chose not to. Same with the ANC. Beyond that, the, the, our aim, as I say, was really to uh, not, not so much to dig out the alternative facts, because those facts are out there. Um, but to get the voices, um, and you know, we again, we would never ever for a microsecond try and portray ourselves as somehow the, the you know, ferrying some sort of authentic Marikana voice. All we can do is quote the people we spoke to and, and give a kind of messy but our best attempt at, at capturing what we understood from our time in that area. But nonetheless, kind of putting those voices front and center rather than doing a lot of forensic work through police files. I think that is best done by and South I'm African And I'm picking South African police is just, I mean, mm. yeah, that's just a can of worms in itself, right? But like, uh, this, uh, is, this is not yeah. something that could be done through, and I don't even think she's, you know, had blame put on her. It's like maybe she's not good enough to do her job. I think that's the strongest wording that came out of the commission. So I, I don't know. That kind of area is, is an aside. Well, well, it, it was explored in in the commission, yeah. right? And then, then that's that's hopefully in the second half we can we can learn more more about exactly that point. Okay. Yeah. Actually, that leads quite nicely into my question. So we've talked about a few things. One is about. Um, Lonmen and cap capitalism and, and its complicity in this. Secondly, is the police forces incompetent. Third one is the long, so in South Africa we've had a t almost 200 years worth of strikes and miners and you know, that whole industry. So from your perspective, from being outsiders, objective minds, is, a, is the Marikana massacre seen as a police incompetence situation? So we're used to strikers, we're used to you know, miners, and the police was just too quick on trigger. Or was this a Lonman specific situation, or was it actually the uh, the mining um, protest came to a specific peak and it fell over? Because I'm not sure people really understand whether there was long-standing mining thing, or was police incompetence, or the other one. So, is it police incompetence, or is it actually a tipping point? I mean, from from the way that I read it, I think it's all sorts of um, factors, all three of those that sort of combined. I mean. 
again, we, we weren't there just to look at the Marikana massacre. I think there's other articles out there that will give you a lot more around that. Um, I don't know if you, I mean, you, you don't really focus too much even on the piece with it. So. Uh, yeah, I mean, lots of the piece in the in the publication is actually about kind of wider resistance in in South Africa today, not just the strike movements, but alternative grassroots political formations that might challenge the social and political dynam dynamics in South Africa. Very, very briefly, in answer to your question, I mean, firstly, I'm not objective. I'm the least objective journalist you're ever going to meet, and I'm and I'm proud of that. And I think any journalist that gets up on any panel and claims that they're objective, alarm bells should be ringing straight away. Um, but but from my very subjective perspective, um, I don't think this was a case of, uh, as, the, as the inquiry report seems to have concluded, that the uh, sort of police incompetence matter, um, I think that the climate in which um, the police could pull the triggers in which 34 almost exclusively unarmed minors could be shot dead uh, on live television <coughs> is uh, something which comes from a far deeper web of political power, corporate power, and state violence. And it's the collusion between um, state and capital and the, 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 the web that, that binds them together that we have to look at if we want to understand why the Marikana massacre happened. But as I say, that is not, a, that is not an objective conclusion, but it is, it's the one that I, that I have. Right, last, yeah, last question. Thank you. Um, I'm just wondering, as a reporter, like, how did you first start approaching these communities um, and, I mean, obviously, the obvious answer would be to, to start and go and talk to the organisers, right? And uh, so, sort of in connection with that first question, how, how organised are these people? These guys that we see in the photos, how much are they sort of organising on a grassroots level? I mean, yeah, there's tons of organisations and the Benchmarks Foundation, which we work with very closely, um, and also worked with other researchers that would work with them. Mm. Um, but they were doing work within Marikana before the massacre. They were probably one of the only people, well, not the only people, but they'd done the most comprehensive amount of work there. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th there are lots of people that open their doors very quickly to, to sort of take in the research. Uh, Benchmarks is really interesting because it's um, a community-led organization, so it has no money from any other sources apart from the church. Um, yeah. And for, for, from the beginning, we were, well, as Jason says, we were organisations that were working on the ground already in the area, so that rather than just sort of, I mean, it's still a flawed process inevitably, but rather than just kind of steaming in with our cameras and our dictaphones and be like, we are here to tell your story, we wanted to try and approach it from a, from a, a slightly more nuanced perspective. And, 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 and you know, people were, were, Richard was asking about trust earlier. Um, trying to build some slightly more sustainable links. I mean, what the hell, a few weeks, five, six weeks, however long we were there, is, is a ridiculously tiny amount, you know, but it's still, you know, six weeks more than most journalists who reported on Marikana kind of spent in and out. So, so um, the Marikana Solidarity Campaign helped us a lot with putting us in touch with the miners themselves, putting us in touch with AMCU, which is the, the trade union, which is now the dominant one on the platinum belt, the Benchmarks Foundation. Spending time on the ground, right? Yeah, Just and mainly spending time on the ground. The, 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 the women, um, the, the main women's group in, in Marikana, Tembisa, who's the main character in the, in the, in, in, in the essay, um, was a member of this group, and uh, she, was, she had been taking her own photos, which is one of the things that first attracted us to her as, a, as, a, as an interviewee, because if we're talking about who gets to pick the camera lens, who gets to kind of show their perspective on Marikana. Um, you know, I hadn't seen photos taken by people within Marikana themselves. And so that was, a, that was a great starting point. And, you know, through her, we met other people. We were introduced to campaigners, to activists. So, yeah, that's, that's how... And they're organising themselves. Absolutely. There's, there's the formal trade union organizations but there's also but what's interesting is so many of the people living in the communities are not directly mine workers they're not unionized they're part part of the precariat and I, I write in, in the essay about that in terms of kind of how how will these people's struggles kind of get folded into the broader political changes that are happening in South Africa at the moment there are different grassroots organizations they're not necessarily coordinated at the moment but that that will be the interesting thing coming forward whether that they can link up can we just uh, finish this this session. Just I, uh, tell us the tell us about just a little bit about the m the mood of the people. I mean, think something like the graves mm -hmm. of the dead. Are they honoured? Are they covered in flowers every day? Are there memorials? Are there um, 
Is there, is there a memorial to those who died? Is there, you know, what are they? Are they? I understand they're all that the that the areas switched to the the economic freedom fighters from the ANC. Well, I mean, that was yeah, that was a huge part. Um, you know, to, tell us a bit more about that. Just yeah. the the mood of the place now. I mean, I mean, uh, visually, the, the, the crosses have mm. been removed. There isn't that, and you know, there is no memorial. There is nowhere one, one place that someone can go. Um, there's bits of graffiti. Um, and there's sort of paint and things from, I is think... Is that fear or is that...? No, no, that's from the, literally the forensic yeah. side of it around the copy where the killings happened. Um, but I think that, you know, Marikana itself is, is, you know, people just trying to survive, just moving forward. I don't think there's time to sort of sit back and let's get some money together and make another yeah. memorial. And the ground, you know, a lot of the land is owned by Lon Min, so, you know, that was one of the reasons why they were on the copy in the first place is because it was one of the only public sites get to in a mass you know the stadium that they had all the rallies in that's owned by Lon Min so you've got a big problem with that sort of the, the sort space. of uh, space yeah exactly the, the memorialization is actually a really is a political hot topic um, on the 16th of August each year now you do have 34 white crosses placed on the on the copy um, the ANC on the, the first anniversary where they tried to have a, a memorial event there the ANC didn't turn up and you know chairs were left empty <laughs> deliberately to, mm. to make that point. Um, as Jason says, th I think it's a really good question because it goes to the heart of the issues I'm trying to explore in the essay, which is corporate control of, of physical space and kind of political discourse, state control of physical space and, uh, and, and, and political discourse, and how people who have been at the wrong ends of corporate and state power can carve out a space within that for their own political struggles and, and memorialization. I mean, the best memorialization of Marikana would be accountability and justice for the massacre and, and political change and economic change on the platinum belt. Um, never mind building a, a monument. You know, that's what's really needed. OK. We're now, we'll break up now uh, and be back at quarter past. So. Uh, Thank Jason and Jack. Thank you, Richard. Thank you. 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 Thank you.